So for the longest time, there have been two adversaries in the film world, the film score and the sound design. The film score is all the music that goes into the film, whereas the sound design, well, the sound design is actually kind of a misnomer. There's actual sound design, which involves creating sounds that don't really exist in our world, like lasers and magic spells and whatever those might sound like. Then there's the foley, which is all the sound that the actors are supposed to make, but because film sets get really noisy, a lot of the actual sound they record tends not to be used. As a matter of fact, ADR, or additional dialogue recording, can be thrown into this group as well. You'd be amazed at how much of the dialogue in a scene is actually recorded in a studio. But you get the idea. It's all the sounds in a film versus all the music in a film. Uh, as a matter of fact, don't listen to me. Take it from the man himself. Sound effects are a big problem for a composer. You know, it's our great competition, the dubbing room, which is when all the, all the uh, sounds are, are being put together. Uh, sometimes if a soundtrack is, is, is completed, the sound effects of a scene, I like to listen to that to see what, what uh, my competition is going to be. Which is kind of a weird sentiment, because like when cartoons first came out, it was the exact opposite. When you look at the old Disney cartoons, a lot of the time they just get a piece of romantic music and then animate according to what happens in the piece. This technique has come to be known as Mickey Mousing. With this technique, it's important to remember that the music comes first and that the animators would change a scene in order to fit what was going on in the score. Um, this is kind of the whole idea behind the Sorcerer's Apprentice scene in Fantasia. It was supposed to pay respect to those older styles of cartoons. But as time went on and cartoons started to stray from their traditional form and basically started having dialogue, the studios had to get creative with how they were going to emulate these sound effects. Technology was really limiting back then. You couldn't just go out and do a field recording, which is pretty much just walking around with a giant microphone and hoping to pick up whatever sound you're looking for. The equipment wasn't accurate enough and it was just too big to really transport. So what a lot of sound departments started to do was they would recreate these sounds in studios, sort of like what we would call Foley nowadays, but basically there were these sound designers who would perform sound effects just like music. But over time, people started to associate these closely scored sound effects with those Disney cartoons, and when they started using it in other contexts, it just started to sound too goofy. Literally. And since then, the worlds of sound effects and film scoring have kind of been at odds and never really come back together. Most people just let the composers work the music and have the sound effects just be the sound effects. And for the most part, this is just how it works in a production cycle. The audio designer who works on the sound effects for a video game, for example, most likely won't have much, if any, contact with the composer of a game and vice versa. As a matter of fact, take a look at this behind the scenes clip where the sound team was working on the final mix for Star Wars Episode 2. You never know what's going to happen until you start running it all together. The whole problem is that we haven't heard Michael's done the dialogue, he hasn't really heard everything that we've done in effects, we haven't heard the music at all, so... Nothing was all. Throw it all into the pot right off the bat and then sort Sometimes it out. Sometimes it's a surprise how it all sounds together. Now, considering how keeping the music and sound effects separate is just how the worlds of television, film, and video games have basically worked since, well, Steamboat Willie, I just kind of accepted that that's how it is, and that's how it's always been done, and that's how it always will be. That was until I heard the controversial piece, 4 minutes and 33 seconds. Now, 4 minutes and 33 seconds was written in 1952 by John Cage, probably the most well-known experimental composer who's ever lived. And the entire piece of 4 minutes and 33 seconds consists of 4 minutes and 33 seconds of absolute silence. It has three movements. The first is 33 seconds long, the second is 2 minutes and 40 seconds, and the last is 1 minute and 20 seconds. And if you look at the score to this piece, and yes, there is a score, you'll just find that each movement says tacit, which is the music term for like silent or just sit out. So if you have a piece of music where you want like a trumpet to play on the first and third movements, but not on the second movement, on the second movement, the trumpet part will say tacit. Now the interpretation you regularly hear about this piece is that it's all about the audience. Like during the performance, someone will cough or shuffle their feet or maybe whisper to whoever's sitting next to them. And that, in fact, is the whole point of 4 minutes and 33 seconds, is that all the sound the audience makes is actually the piece of music. I've also heard people argue that this piece is about, like, the discipline of the performer. Like, it takes a lot of guts to walk onto a giant stage and just stare at a piano or a stopwatch for four and a half minutes. Maybe this piece is designed to test the performer's nerve. Some other more highbrow arguments have involved, like, the pursuit of mastery, and that this piece is more about how a composer demonstrates their mastery over music. Now that's great and all. Debate away. Have your philosophical arguments. What really interested me was that John Cage wrote sequels to this piece. That's right. The silent piece has not one, not two, not three, but kind of like two and a half sequels. 
1962, Cage wrote a response to 4 minutes and 33 seconds, insightfully called 4 minutes and 33 seconds number 2. This piece is also known as 0 minutes and 0 seconds, and it involves a single line of instruction. In a situation provided with maximum amplification, perform a disciplined action. As if that wasn't confusing enough, during the second performance of 4 minutes and 33 seconds number 2, which I like to call 4 minutes and 33 seconds number 2.5, Cage added 4 more qualifiers for the performance of this sequel. 1. The performer should allow any interruptions of the action. 2. The action should fulfill an obligation to others. 3. The same action should not be used in more than one performance. And 4. The action should not be the performance of a musical composition. The next sequel, which was called One Cubed, well, okay, actually the full title is this, was written in 1989, one year before Cage died. And the idea behind this piece is that a music hall has to be put on the edge of feedback without any actual feedback. Meaning that there's a microphone sitting on stage, turned up to max, and just left there. And the idea is that you're listening to the music hall. All of the noises that the audience make will get picked up by the microphone and will be played back to the audience. In essence, making the audience the performance. And with that, these sequels should suddenly start making sense. With each sequel, Cage was disproving people's theories about 4 minutes and 33 seconds. When people started saying that the audience was the performance, he specifically wrote a piece of music where the audience was the performance, meaning that 4 minutes and 33 seconds must have meant something else. People started saying that this piece was about discipline, so he made an actual piece that was about discipline, meaning that 4 minutes and 33 seconds must have been about something else. People started saying that it was about the pursuit of mastery and the celebration of performance, and Cage showed that that wasn't what this piece was about. With each sequel, Cage showed his critics that they didn't understand his silent piece, and that each of their assumptions could be better expressed through another piece of music. Which leaves us with two questions. What is 4 minutes and 33 seconds actually about, and what does this have to do with sound effects? Well, let me tell you, it's all about defining music. When I was in school, my composition professor would constantly tell me that music is defined as a series of organized sounds, which I think is a slight alteration of a quote from a madman called Edgar Varese, who once said, what is music but organized noises? Either way, if music truly is just a series of organized sounds, then 4 minutes and 33 seconds qualifies as one of the most basic and primordial pieces of music ever to exist. Exist. Now this is going to sound like something that you'd see quoted on Pinterest, but it's completely true. Time is the canvas on which we paint music. Music has an inherent temporal component. So by having a piece of music that consists only of the time that it takes to perform, and effectively nothing else, you've created the most simple form or piece of music. And when you think about it, there isn't really a single composer in history who hasn't had to use silence in their piece. Whether it be the silence before a piece begins, or after a piece ends, or even the silence in between the notes or the motifs or the phrases. Every composer has had to actively use silence in their music in one way or another. Now, if this whole absence of sound thing still bothers you, I might be able to use Bob Ross here to explain it a little better. So Bob Ross used a wet-on-wet -wet style of oil painting. That's one of the reasons his paintings took so little time to create. So at the beginning of every episode, Ross starts with setting up his canvas and easel, gets his paints and his brushes and his paint thinners and whatever else he might need, but then he paints a blank canvas white as a primer to begin painting. And I've just covered the entire canvas with a very thin coat of liquid white. The liquid white is designed just to make the canvas wet and, and to make it slick. It allows us to actually blend color right here on the canvas. But what if he just left it at that? What if he left the white paint on the canvas and called it a day? Is it still a painting? Well, he painted it, he put thought into it, he did as much to the canvas as he wanted to. And you can say the same thing for Cage. He set up the amount of time he wanted to, and he put exactly as much sound as he wanted to put onto his temporal canvas. So, if music is the process of applying as many sounds as you want to a temporal space, or a series of organized sounds, then how is this not music? See, in the world of production, the music and the sound design are the last two things that happen to a film. And if you're a longtime viewer of the channel, you'll know how much I hate that all of the audio to a piece of media is left to the last minute, and is never really given as much time to develop into a literary tool as other aspects of any type of media. Sometimes if a soundtrack is, is, is completed, the sound effects of a scene, I like to listen to that to see what, what 
uh, my competition is going to be. If the if the oral spectrum is crowded in the high end, I might elect to to orchestrate it in in the in the lower uh, frequency ranges to 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 make it more compatible with the sound effects. But this is really this is a this is a rare luxury. Usually, the sound effects are being cut for the sequences at the same time the music is being written. But there are exceptions to this case. For example, if you have a film where you want the characters to be singing songs, you have to have that music ready before you begin filming. Having said that, in some extremely rare cases, the composer is a part of the creative team from the very beginning. Like with The Nightmare Before Christmas, a personal favorite, Tim Burton was showing Danny Elfman concept art and general ideas of the world before the story had even been completed. Basically, we didn't really have a script and uh, there was the storyline that Tim had had from years earlier. We were running out of time. <laughs> I just said, well, I'll just start writing some of the songs based on what we talked about. And I started and he'd come over and he'd listen to it. And then I'd say, let's just talk about the next section of the movie. And we'd talk about it and tell me, oh, and he does this and that. And I said, great, great. And as soon as he left, I'd immediately go and start writing that next song. There was a similar situation with the production cycle to Wally. The production team had contacted Mr. Lightsaber himself to do all the sound for the animated film, and they started paying extra close attention to the sounds while the film was still technically being filmed, or drawn, or animated, or however you film a CGI movie. It was something new for us also at Pixar that we had a sound designer in-house on a film before post, you know? It was a little funny at first for me when um, Andrew would start uh, evaluating sounds that I was making. He would show up and five or six other, a group would show up and they'd all sit around and I'd, I'd play one little sound of a door close and click and everybody would think about it, there'd be a discussion. And that film managed to get away with almost zero dialogue for the opening of the film. Wally and Eve technically talk to each other at like the 20-ish minute mark, but you don't really hear any scripted human dialogue until right around 40 minutes into the film. I seriously doubt Pixar would have been able to get away with that had they not taken Bert's expertise into account. But all this begs the question, what would happen if for a TV show or a film or a video game, you had the producer get the director, sound designer, and composer to all work together from the very beginning of the creative process in order to allow the sound designer and composer to coordinate how they were gonna sculpt the acoustic landscape of your production. Because in the end of the day, what are sound effects other than a series of organized sounds? I'm constructing this mentally as I go, so it's sort of a intensive, it's composition. That's it for me for now, guys. Thanks for watching. Like, comment, subscribe. Do whatever you got to do. Follow me on Twitter. Follow me on Twitch. I'll answer all your musical questions. Uh, and if you really like this video for whatever reason, consider donating to my Patreon page. But for now, that's going to be it. Thanks for watching.